It is almost impossible for an individual brought up from childhood in Christianity to become a Christian. You can't be a real, sincere, authentic practitioner in your own tradition if you're not somewhat in touch with the wisdom of other traditions. Like at this day and age, that's just not, that doesn't work anymore. And the way I talk about it, and Adam Bucko actually shared this teaching with me from Father Bede Griffiths, which also resonates with me and I've heard in, in many other places, but this sense of the palm of the hand is where uh, all the wisdoms of all the ages and all the cultures and countries and places, that's one. And the fingers are the different pathways to that uh, common mystery and understanding and ability to actually live well in this world, in these bodies. We can do that. And these different paths try to take us there, but they're all going to the same place, so there's not like a different endpoint. And they're all coming from the same place. They're just expressing themselves in different ways. There is real relevance to these different paths. And I also see that we are at a time in, in our history collectively where we can't be over here. <laughs> you know, we have to be making the journey to the, to the common places because that's also what's gotten us into trouble is this, I have the path, I have the way, my tradition, my whatever is, but there's this need, there's this real need to synthesize, bring together, not try to merge, but there is a need to be much more aware. In the Buddhist way of seeing, everyone has Buddha nature. Everyone has this capacity to be much more than we think we are. And other traditions speak about the same thing different language. And, and the biblical fr Trinitarianism is about the abyss, about our relationship to the abyss of mystery. And the second part of this triune event is a viewpoint, a viewpoint on the abyss. It's like Muslims and Jews and Christians are all standing around one black hole looking into the same black hole with three different viewpoints. It's Islam, Judaism, and Christianity are more agreed than they are different. But what we have in common is that the abyss is friendly. That the abyss is an enrichment, always enriching your life, good for you. That there's, in other words, to say that is realistic living is really the best case scenario for a human being. I mean, we've all tried other things, and what they end up with is, we'll look at this this afternoon some more, despair. Because all these other things you might worship are not dependable. You worship your nation? My God. This nation is as undependable, it appears, as anything else in the world. Even your family is, you know, it'll let you down time to time. But if you worship reality, well, one thing you can count on is that reality is almighty. <laughs> and it's going to be there in the same way tomorrow. Uh, utterly dependable on being reality. And in promoting your realism. If you get off track on realism, you can get slapped around pretty hard. Uh, or nudged, you might say, back into the fold of, of, of some realism. In the beginning was the relationship, and the relationship was with God, and the relationship was God. The relationship was, in the beginning, with God. All things were made through this relationship, and without this relationship was not anything made that was made. In this relationship was life, and the life was the light of humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Actually, the human experiences of the eternal elephant 
My idea is that we're all like blind men when we face this eternal abyss, uh, seeing different parts of, of the experience of the abyss. And some people come up with a tail, and some people come up with a trunk, and some people come up with a wall, and some people come up with uh, towers or whatever. So the elephant uh, appears to us in multiple different ways, but it's one elephant that all of us blind <laughs> explorers uh, are, are exploring. I also grew up in, in another culture. Uh, I'm, I'm Roman Catholic. And if there is one thing that is not well enough understood about Catholicism, I think, is that it is based on, on what the Catholic calls sacramentality, that every single thing in your life is part of the other magnet, the other side of the magnet. So all of our sacraments use very, very natural elements to express them, water, and candles, and incense, and oil. What do those things speak of? Nature, what it is to be human, where God is. So now you have the magnet and a, a consciousness, a taught and educated consciousness that all of this is, is of the great creation. And then finally you have religion. The function of religion is to lead us beyond itself. In too many instances, religion stops with itself. It becomes our answer to our own development, let alone our, our, our moral uh, role in the world, our consciousness of our, our responsibility. I want to end by saying that's all there is to it. Scenario of life means we cannot live you know, only within these five scandals. These five scandals are living together with other beings, depending upon the condition of people around me or people in the entire society. You know, my life also changed, and we need to understand what is the scenery, what is the things happening, and what is the problem, and what might make the situation better or healthier. We have to live in a collected way of things happening outside of ourselves. Our life is, our practice, not living as a hermit. Escape from the society and live oneself within the deep mountain, with that connection with the society, or people happening. So the scenario of life is uh, our life is always together with things happening outside ourselves or around me. So the self is together with the scenery. We have to uh, interconnect and work together, cooperate with uh, the things happening in the society. Uchamoroshi's teaching, he, I read when I was a high school student. He wrote in his first book about what Zazen is. And he, he used the analogy of the earth and atmosphere. He said, uh, when we draw a circle of about six inches, the thickness of the pencil is the thickness of the atmosphere. But we living beings living on the earth and we, we see the clouds are much higher than ours. And under the cloud, all the different scenery or condition of the world uh, is changing. Sometimes it's very clear and bright and peaceful, but sometimes it's uh, covered with dark clouds and sometimes we have storms. Underneath the clouds, we need to be influenced by that conditions always changing. To Jamrosh is saying, that is what is happening within our mind. Our mind is only such a shallow space uh, within our life. Our life is much deeper. But we think things happening only within this shallowness is important. 
but he, what he said is we need to understand even though we have to, we cannot escape from different weathers. But sky is always blue and sun is always shining above the clouds. So don't be moved by the things happening within this atmosphere. But we need to see our life is much deeper and higher, much greater, much larger than what I think this is world. For us, world means the atmosphere. And we, are, we have to live underneath the clouds. But uh, beyond the clouds, the sky is always blue and sun is always uh, shining. That is first teaching I understood <laughs> when I was 17 years old. And still that is my basic image of what Zazen is. I've gotten really so much respect for the kind of hidden teachings of Christianity that aren't necessarily in the mainstream. It's just to me quite phenomenal that the language is so similar and the insights are so similar and I resonate with them. We read together, he and I, people who have done a lot of work in both kind of landscapes. So a Dominican friar who came and studied with Thay, Thich Nhat Hanh, and wrote a book about Meister Eckhart and Thich Nhat Hanh being his two main teachers, or a couple where man is a Buddhist, Roshi, the woman's a Catholic, you know, and they're writing about the rosary and their common practice of the rosary as a Buddhist Christian couple. As we delve into these other folks that are doing this amazing work of being in dialogue, there's just so much. And it's also like one tradition kind of needs the other to bring out certain things. It's like only from this perspective are you able to nourish that thing. That if you're in it, if you're in that framework, you won't see that special seed that needs to be watered. But if you're not in that framework, you can help, the other tradition can help aspects to grow and to express themselves more beautifully, more fully, more clearly through the engagement. And it's not just Christianity and Buddhism, but all traditions that can shape and enrich each other in that way. I do not foresee, however, the world becoming all one religion. We're going to always have a great variety of religious practices. But in an interreligious world, we Christians need to learn from the Buddhists. And the Buddhists need to learn from the Christians. I mean, the Christians that are really getting hold of their Christianity. Uh, because this is the world we live in. We have to be, we can't have a whole continent of Christians. There is no such thing anymore. And we can't have a whole continent of Buddhists. There is no such thing anymore. Uh, so we are going to be an interreligious world with a great variety of religious practices, but all those practices to be good are helping us access something universal about being human. Now, now that's a very controversial insight. One common mystery, one abyss, one reality, one deep place, one natural world, one elephant, one atmosphere, and all interconnected, yet different viewpoints. And from this, I must now choose my posture my path, and my practice. This ultimate journey is just beginning. Let's see what comes next. <laughs>